Good morning. Uh, I'm Doug Smith. Uh, welcome back to Portsmouth this week. Today is the 11th of January. Uh, today we have with us uh, uh, two guests, uh, and our topic of discussion today is going to be the uh, Elmhurst School Chapel and the related uh, issues around that. Our, my guests today are Andrew Kelly and Alan Shears. Uh, both were members of the Elmhurst Reuse Planning Committee. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank welcome. You. Alan, let me first start with you because I, I know you've been involved in this for, for some time. Can you tell us about the recent history of the school and, and going forward? Well, the recent history, I'll, I'll take it from the position that the school was closed uh, and, and the reasons for it was that there was uh, uh, questions about the uh, safety of the school, the various uh, uh, aspects along that where the driver also costs and whatnot. So from that point on, uh, the school has been uh, closed and uh, they re a reuse committee was formed and that reuse committee was formed uh, to come up with some suggestions for other uses that possibly the school could uh, uh, be used for. Uh, and, and or in compliance with the abutting Glen Manor House. Uh, at that point, a committee was formed. Uh, studies uh, were done, for, uh, meetings were held, and uh, at those uh, uh, meetings, a couple of suggestions uh, were derived. Uh, one of them was uh, with the Aqu Aquidneck Island Land Trust that they would uh, uh, be willing to uh, give a million dollars towards uh, the demolition and other related issues uh, on the site uh, for a conservation easement. There was a uh, second uh, proposal that was really an adjunct uh, of that. Uh, consequently, uh, it was found through meetings with the town that uh, there were studies that needed to occur uh, in regards to topography, uh, environmental, coastal resources, uh, drainage, uh, and the like. And uh, presently, uh, the uh, firm of uh, VHB is uh, through uh, doing a study, uh, we hope in the next uh, month or two, from uh, the uh, information we have to uh, give uh, data in that regards. Uh, it's my assumption that after that time the town will uh, digest the results and uh, then c come back with a, uh, uh, a solution or at least a direction uh, that, the, that they suggest for the town to take. Yeah, it's, uh, I think uh, as, as you, you're saying, the, where it's located, there's, there are a lot of top, uh, topographical and other drainage and other issues. It's right on the waterfront. It's right next to Glen Manor House. Um, just, j just to reconstruct the time frame, the school was closed in 2009. I assume the planning, the uh, reuse planning committee was formed like in 2010 perhaps. And I know you guys were out for a, a, just about a year. Uh, I, I was at the, at the meeting where you guys discussed your, your conclusions and, and you discussed also the lengthy process you went through coming to those conclusions, looking at all kind of different alternatives. Uh, so, so you reported out, this was last year, I think, 2012, to the town council. And that was just the same time that, I guess, Ted Clements and the uh, Quidnick Land Trust must have come into you guys just before you reported in uh, to provide that option. Uh, so essentially, w w what, what you guys were looking at was primarily the, the demolition of the school because it was probably a, a liability to the town. And then the second thing came up was this beautiful chapel facility that's inside the school. Uh, and uh, I know a lot of people, primarily driven by Andrew, kudos to you, I think, uh, brought up the, the real beauty of this place and the possibility of using it uh, later on. Andrew, do you want to talk a little bit about the chapel part of this? Yeah, sure. The, uh, the chapel is 7,000 square feet, um, which is is very big for a, for a building in Portsmouth. Um, behind me here is uh, the 10 stained glass windows that are part of the chapel. In the interior, it's brickwork and wood trellises that go all the way to the ceiling. Um, and underneath the linoleum tile is, is flagstone. It's, very, it's a very attractive building. I wish I had older pictures. Um, 
it, it, I think it can be saved for, for an arts in, uh, for a community center uh, based around the performing arts because you, you have the large enough space to fit an audience of you know, hundreds of people. Yeah, I, I went on the, one of the tours down there. Yeah. And uh, probably the first one, I think you were there too, Alan. Yeah. And there's a sign on the, on the wall that says capacity 450. That might have been for one half. That was know. for, that was for, th that was for three fifths of the, the, the three chapel. fifths of the yeah. space. Yeah, because it was, it was divided. It is divided, I it guess, into divided. two spaces right That's now. right. So but the interesting thing to me is the stained glass windows are beautiful, but the really beautiful part, and, and I, maybe you can take a look at the other picture over there, it's a, it's a, a painting, essentially, of it's the chapel. It's a drawing of a concept. But the really beauty of this thing was the ceiling to me. It's all natural wood, and it looks, it looks like it's in very good condition. When was this built, the chapel? Was the, the chapel was finished in the early 1960s. So it's not that old. So it's not that old. Yeah. It's 40-ish years old. A little over 40 years old. One of the issues that came up, uh, we went through with Dave Kehu of the Public Works. He was kind of leading the tour through there. And one of the issues that came up is, can this be a standalone? You know, it's right in the middle of, of essentially the school. Can this be a standalone? Is it structurally okay to have a standalone facility? Well, uh, I went through with a couple of uh, uh, contractors that uh, looked at the, uh, demolishing the, the school and uh, they both indicated, the two that uh, really did extensive uh, review, that it, it couldn't, <coughs> excuse me, it could be uh, saved around the school. However, uh, there would be an added cost because they would be uh, having to be careful as they demolished the uh, for the school, demolition of the school, the, the sure, because they have to demolish around it. Uh, but I think that uh, so so there is that possibility of of saving it. Uh, what you have uh, is a an existing septic system that uh, abuts the property that has about a seven hundred thousand gallon capacity. Uh, the building the chapel that would be left of 7,000 square feet, even factoring uh, as a, uh, a garage open space at 35 or so dollars a square foot, it's another uh, close to a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, also, there's a six... No, no, for know, what? For To do for, what? To, to do uh, any kind of reuse, the shell itself. What I'm getting around to is what the existing improvement values are there to work with. And uh, between the uh, windows, the septic system, the existing water line that would support sprinklers, uh, the shell of it, you have probably an existence of at least a mil million dollars in value. Now, to build a new building, uh, the uh, gym that was built at the uh, high school, that came in somewhere between between, well, it was over $300 a square foot. I think it was closer to 325 So factoring $350 a square foot at today's price on 7,000 square feet, if you were starting from scratch, your cost would be about $2.5 million. So I've already mentioned that we have about a million dollars of improvements. To probably um, retrofit the building out for use, uh, you're looking at 7,000 square feet. If you took a ballpark of $100 a square foot, you'd be looking at about $700,000. The parking lot that would be required for it, which would be about another 300 cars, uh, that would be uh, probably uh, another $300,000. So you're, I'm looking at it that uh, probably take around at least a million dollars to finish off the property and to reuse okay, it. So, so essentially you're saying that the property would be worth about a million dollars to the town? As it stands right now as far as the improvements. If everything else was taken down around it. Right. Uh, the septic system would be huge. That's huge for a... For it's already there. It's, uh, it's already there. Yeah. yeah. So it's a matter of connecting up and maybe new toilets or facilities and things around it I guess. Uh, so a total, perhaps, and then you add another million dollars that it would take to bring it up to, uh, to be able to use it. Right. So that's two million bucks. Uh, and back me up on the on the high school on the gym. You're the, the gym when that was uh, 
uh, built that was over uh, $300 a square foot the, uh, the, the, the cost when that was built. So using um, Davis Bacon and the cost for uh, schools uh, in shells uh, that it's not out of line that somebody could estimate that uh, approximately $350 a square foot for 7,000 square feet if something was built from scratch uh, okay. in that manner. Okay, so the, the key will be uh, getting an estimate of what it's going to cost to tear down everything around it. Well, I had an indication from the people that looked at it, and uh, at the time they s said that it would be somewhere like around $200,000 more to uh, uh, tear it down and leave okay, with well, leaving than, than the demolition cost if everything just came okay, off Okay, did, the did they give you, so can you give me a, an idea of the cost then, the estimated cost? Well, the uh, estimate that I had was uh, somewhere like around a million dollars to to uh, to tear it down, and then one point two. One point two with that. Okay, uh, I think it's interesting that that the, the the facility itself can be considered standalone. It will. It's got the walls and it's got the it's got the foundation. Uh, Infrastructure changes that would be needed. Uh, what would you need to do with this million dollars? You, you mentioned a few things, but uh, we're talking about access. Uh, well, you need any any kind of construction needs ADA uh, access, ADA uh, facilities, bathrooms, and whatnot. A heating system, electrical uh, to it. Uh, so those would be some of the main components. I uh, referred to sprinkler system. Uh, in any okay. kind of, so those are the types of items that yeah. would have to go to finishing and off. And a lot of these things were part of the original school, which will be torn down, like the heating system. That's I, right. I, I right. Would assume things like that. Oh, well, there are the two boilers that are still there, but they're a little bit over. Um, ex they did exceed the use that the way we need them for. They'd put out more heat than is necessary for a seven thousand square foot building. Because okay. they were used for the entire building. Now, are they near the chapel part, or are they in the, some other part of the school? They're in the they're in the vault near the underneath the back courtyard of the manor house. So they're they're so, relatively so close to the chapel. So it's possible to use part of that then, yes. perhaps. I guess I guess the uh, that, that's probably what it all is going to come down to is what are the uh, what are the costs associated with saving the chapel versus tearing the whole thing down, and then two, uh, how do we pay for <laughs> for the cost of demolition? And that brings in the Equidnik Land Trust. And either one of you guys want to discuss that proposal? Uh, well, the Equidnik Land Trust offered a million dollars to the, t well, okay, so a million dollars and then $150,000 matching grants for the Lower Glen Farm Barns. But a million dollars to tear down Elmhurst School and to improve the area around Elmhurst School okay. to a waterfront park. Um, there'll be more, you know, I'm sure that they'll put more money into the park than the uh, whatever's left from the demolition. Okay, and this is a return for an uh, open space <coughs> easement of yeah, much of most of the rest of Glen Farm. A conservation easement of and Glen Park, I guess, right? Yeah, basically all of Glen Glen Park, uh, the Garner Seventy Sports Complex, Glen Park, um, where the picnic area is, the rest of the Glen Manor House property, um, with several out zones of which one the chapel falls into. Yeah. And as I recall, when, when we were looking at this issue, uh, when the town council was looking at this issue, uh, when we originally, the town originally acquired that land, uh, in the referendum that was held to do that, it, it indicated that it would be held for open space for people to use, for the public to use. Uh, excuse me, I'd like to step in on that. Uh, when the school was acquired from the uh, uh, Catholic, from the nuns, that was 68 acres in that portion, the lower, that was in 1972. A bond issue was uh, uh, taken out from the town for $1,450,000. The stamps, there's some question of whether the actual sales price was $1,350,000 or $1,450,000, but it says uh, nowhere in that acquisition that it would be used for recreation and open space. The reason for the purchase of the lower area was strictly uh, the motivation for the school. The upper portion uh, is the uh, of about 82 plus acres 
was purchased for recreation and open space. The total acreage of, that we're talking about is 162 acres. That is uh, from a reference of the deeds and also from vision appraisal, what they have down for the various plots that are included. Uh, okay, so the Aquinic Land Trust proposal, is that for the whole 100 and something acres? Yes, that's correct. To, to make all of that open space. But I just wanted to because there's a misnomer out there that, that the whole thing was bought yeah. or taken over for recreation now. Okay, but a large chunk was. Uh, about 80, 80 acres is a little over half. Yeah. A little over half. Yeah. My, my point is that well, from what you're saying then, the rest of that land then is really not protected yet by, by anything. Well, well it's it, protected by the town and the well, citizens. By, by the town council, but I'm saying the, theoretically then the town council could turn around and sell it. No, there's, well, no, there's a, uh, uh, within the charter review, uh, we were both members of the latest charter review, and uh, if uh, anything over two acres uh, in the town that's owned by the town has to come up for a, a vote by the townspeople. So, so uh, even if there was a uh, rogue council at some time, which there yeah. certainly is not, uh, okay. it's protected by the, the so, vote. So of the there, town. there will be a referendum. I know the town council uh, essentially agreed last year to have a try to have a referendum in the spring, public referendum on this issue. Uh, and I also understand from from the time that that the reuse commission committee uh, made their proposal to the, or their, their, their recommendations to the town council. From that time forward, uh, the town has been in negotiations more or less with the Aquinnick Land Trust on some of the words, I think, of this. Uh, any idea where, where that has, has gone or? Well, I, I believe uh, um, Mr. Clements, that was the, uh, was the uh, director of the Aquinnick Island Land Trust has, uh, and now I believe he's uh, gone and is now uh, doing the same thing in, in Hawaii. But uh, we have Chuck Allett, uh, that is uh, the interim uh, head of the trust. And uh, his indications uh, recently uh, that I heard was that this was still on the front burner, that they were very much uh, interested in, in uh, pursuing the uh, actions that uh, Ted had been working on. So. Uh, this, this certainly is an issue. I, I, I believe that uh, our town administrator, uh, the Equidnick Island Land Trust, the town council are all now working on this and, and, uh, uh, I, and I think that uh, Mr. Klim, the town administrator, is going to be giving some update on some of the activities at yeah. the next town council meeting this coming Monday. Of, uh, the 14th at 7 o'clock. Yeah, and I know last year they were discussing a RFP, a request for proposals to do the demolition work. And before they got to that, they realized because of all those features and things that they need some expertise on how to craft the RFP. They uh, contracted with a company called VHB, I believe. That's right. And I think they're, they're working on this. And, and the, the point of the RFP is to come up with uh, hard estimates for essentially the removal of the Elmer School property uh, and then exclusive of the manor house and chapel, you hope, and then re and removal of, of the building, reshaping of the land, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of stuff. Uh, do we have any idea how far along that, I, I, I know you mentioned that earlier, you think in the next month or two somebody's gonna come out with that. What about the, uh, the uh, referendum? You think that'll be able to be done this spring? Or do you think there's a, there's a problem with uh, timing of all this? Well, it's, it's possible that it'll be done in the spring. Um, it really depends a lot on the negotiations with the land trust after they get the, the request for proposals back. Okay. After the bids come in. Okay. Because it could be a lot more than a million dollars to yeah. tear down the school. It could be a lot well, less. That's true, but let's say we say no to the Aquinnick Land Trust. Where do we get a million dollars from? Nobody's giving us a million dollars to do anything. Well, they're, they're the only million dollars in town, as far as I can see. Well, there's other avenues uh, that uh, on any kind of uh, financing, which, which admittedly is very difficult now, but you do have avenues of uh, grants, uh, donation, uh, bonding. Uh, the Glen Manor House itself uh, uh, <coughs> is a profitable enterprise. Uh, 
I hate to say it, but uh, tax levy. I mean, there's all sorts of. Oh yeah, uh, there, I'm sure there are ways that, to do uh, it. I'm to just, raise the I, money. I guess I'm just saying that the, from from a citizen standpoint, the a million dollars is a million dollars, and and I think a lot of people in Portsmouth, including myself, feel that 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 area should be kept for open space. But that's a whole other issue, I guess. So we're looking forward possibly to a referendum, public referendum on this issue, hopefully this spring or at least in the summer. We hope. Uh, try to get this passed. What do you think are some of the potential uses of the chapel for the town, if it can be saved? Yeah, well, like I said earlier, community arts and cultural, uh, arts and performing arts and cultural center, because it's a 7,000 square foot building. It'd be great for meetings. The town could have committee meetings there. It could have large meetings there. When you have a capacity of over 600 people, you know, you can get a lot of stuff done. The, um, the reason I say performing arts is because, you know, the vision would have a stage in it, and the stage would, the clearance is, all right, so in Portsmouth, we don't have a space to do performing arts. We have the high school, which has an 11-foot clearance, and we've got the middle school, which is a triangle-shaped stage. Cogsdale School stage is good for small performances, as Mr. George Furbish has, has said in the paper. He would even look if he had large productions to a larger venue. Right now, something we don't have. So yeah, George is the uh, chairman of the Arts and Culture Committee. That's think, correct. Right? And um, so it would be used for for a number of things. I mean, it would we wouldn't fix any seating to the floor, so it could be used for just about anything. Okay, uh, and, and you know who would uh, Glen Manor House is run by essentially a professional. Uh, couple who live there and do a great job of keeping the place up and mm -hmm. and scheduling everything. Who would? How do you see someone managing from the from the town this chapel? Would that be part of what they do, perhaps? Well, or? the voters in November approved a recreation department, so it could fall under the Portsmouth Recreation Department if it ever comes to fruition. Okay. Uh, also, being formed is. Is a nonprofit organization. Uh, Got to file the paperwork to, it, similar to the St. Anne's Arts and Cultural Center in Woonsocket, they have a you know preserve the St. Anne's Arts and Cultural Center, and that group of volunteers runs the Arts and Cultural Center, and they turn a profit every year, and they, you know, they they don't make a lot of money, but they make enough to sustain themselves. Okay, kind of like Glen Manor House. I mean, it's able to maintain and do the maintenance well, and things like that. The Manor House does make money. Yeah, it does make a profit for the town mm -hmm. yeah. in addition to the maintenance and things that they do. That's right. But I think a question also with that, uh, I've been asked, well, is it going to make a, a profit? Um, I think the town has to ask themselves the question because uh, maybe it doesn't make a uh, a total dollar for dollar return, but if there's uses that the town itself can get out of it, whether it's as partial sen senior center, partial uh, government meetings and uh, related issues of that, then there certainly has to be some value in that. So that's, yeah. those are questions I think that have to be answered. Uh, you know, in the I, pr I presume it could be used, for example, for the town could rent the facility for that's people right. to use, so it might be right. uh, able to generate some revenues that way. Right. Uh, I, I, I assume both of you guys are, are really in favor of, of keeping the chapel, if we can, if it makes economic sense. That's right. Yeah, if, if, the, if the numbers uh, Alan, work... you're my touchstone on economic yeah. issues, so... If, I, if, if, if the numbers work and they're not uh, way out of line, where there is a, a burden that uh, is uh, too great to take, so uh, I think right now uh, we're still waiting to hear back and, and get more data uh, to digest. Uh, I think this is an issue that shouldn't be rushed into. Uh, it should be studied uh, he heavily and, and uh, whatever time is needed should be taken to look at it. Yeah, I, I, I understand that and I understand the need to do due diligence on this thing. And as everybody says, forever is a long time, you know, as our current uh, town council president has said. Uh, I do think, though, that uh, 
this is an issue that I think a lot of people in Portsmouth are are interested in, have a side on. I think it'll I think it'll come out in the in the referendum, and I, I guess I, I just hate to see study after study being done as a way to delay it if we can. But I I certainly understand what you're saying. What do you think the next action we're going to see here on this issue? Well, when the when the RFP comes back from VHB will be probably the next the next step. Okay. Because that'll, that'll tell us everything. Okay, that'll come into the town hall, be presented to the town council. Yep, uh, and we'll now, review that. Now, is there that. still an entity? Are you guys, the reuse committee, still in existence? And are you still kind of the advocate for this? Or or is it the, uh, there, there used to be an Elmhurst planning committee, right? Yeah. Um, the Elmhurst planning committee is currently, um, is probably going to be mentioned on the town council agenda on Monday. Okay, so we'll get, we'll probably get a little bit of an update on Monday yeah. then. Okay, just a couple more things to mention. Uh, I think the most exciting thing is that the high school marching band is going to the inaugural th later on this month, uh, and that'll be about 150, 160 kids going down there. Uh, if, if you'd like to learn more about supporting this really tremendous effort uh, by the high school band members and, and, and their leadership, uh, just go to the... Uh, School website, which is PortsmouthSchoolsRI.org, okay. or you can Google the Portsmouth High School Band bo uh, Music Boosters. Okay, those are two good sources. Uh, one other note, I, as as I I, uh, I always would be apt to say, this is our 375th year, uh, 2013. This is a great additional event to kick off this season, and I hope you'll all support these kids. Another one, though, that just came across my, my email today was uh, the Portsmouth Middle School Robotics, Robotics Club, the uh, Gizmo Geezer Gang, which is mostly seventh grade uh, middle school kids, are in a contest uh, in a final uh, tomorrow over at Roger Williams University. It's the first Lego League state championship, and the competition, it's free and open to the public at Roger Williams University from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, if you've got some spare time, let's go over and support our Portsmouth Middle School robotics kids. Uh, that's about it for me. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you in another edition of Portsmouth This Week. The 375th anniversary of the founding of Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Portsmouth was settled in 1638 by a group of religious dissenters from the Boston Colony, including Dr. John Clark, William Coddington, and Anne Hutchinson. It is named after Portsmouth, Hampshire, England. Roger Williams convinced the settlers that they should go to Rhode Island instead of settling in New Jersey. Portsmouth was founded by the signers of the Portsmouth Compact. Its original Indian name was Pocasset. To honor the founding of our town and its subsequent history, the community of Portsmouth plans a series of public events and observances over the course of the year. Planning for these events has begun and volunteers are needed to participate in developing and conducting these civic events. Join your friends and neighbors and help us all celebrate Portsmouth's 375th year.